Father, thank you for your goodness in our lives. We are truly blessed. And Lord, as we spend some time together at your feet, Jesus, I thank you that you are revealing yourself from one measure of glory to another measure of glory, from one place of faith to a greater place of faith, and from one taste of grace to a greater taste. Thank you for all that you've done, doing, and will do. In your name I pray, amen. Well, I'm excited about being with you over the next few sessions, and we're going to discuss the subject of being transformed, being transformed and the process of the Christian life and going through what the Bible calls this transformation. If you've been here very long, you know that the mission statement of the church is we exist to see people transformed by Jesus. Well, what does that mean? What does that look like? What is the process of that? How does that work? How does God save us and change us in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation? So I'm going to share in this session three foundational things that every Christian needs to be established in and understand in order to cooperate with this transformation that God is doing in our lives. See, pure Christianity is not behavior modification. True Christianity is not just you trying in and of yourself to be or to do better. It's trusting God to be all He's called you to be and trusting God to empower you through this new creation, the new birth, to do all God's called you to do. And so many people struggle in their Christian life. They, they struggle with change in their life because they don't understand the process. They don't understand how everything starts on the inside of you and works its way out in pure Christianity. Not like the religions of the world where everything's outside of you trying to get in. Everything's already inside of you in Christ trying to get out. God's not trying to get into your life. He's trying to get out of your life into the world. And I didn't know that. I did not understand that early in my Christian life. And I'm just embarrassed to have to say publicly how bad I really struggled, how much I failed, how much condemnation I just had to deal with, and disappointment, and disillusion. And I can't tell you how many times... Between 1965 and 1980, that I questioned, am I really saved? Because I had a bad thought. Am I really saved? I had a bad attitude. Now, none of you have a bad attitude, <laughs> especially right after I preach. <laughs> I'd say things I knew I shouldn't have said that. I would do things that I knew, man, I didn't want to do that. I, I shouldn't have done that. How could I do that? And, and be saved. And so I just really struggled. And I've met thousands of people because they don't understand these three basic foundational truths in what salvation is and how this transformative life and the process takes place and learning just to cooperate with God now that you've met Him. So let's talk about the three. Let me just say them so your mind can get acclimated and prepared Everything starts in the Christian life with a new birth. You have to be born again. You have to be born over, and it's supernatural. It's supernatural. And in the new birth, God changes your heart. He changes you inside and joins your spirit with the very spirit of Christ. Then, once you've experienced and encountered the true and the living God, and now you've exercised faith in Him, you have to learn to offer now your bodies a living sacrifice daily to the Lord. And if you don't know how to do that and you don't practice that, then Satan will use your flesh and tempting you in your flesh to draw you away from the things of God and you'll just feel like a failure like I did for so many years. And then the third foundational truth that empowers you to be the living sacrifice is the renewing of your mind. The renewing of your mind. And what does that really look like? And what does that, what does that mean? So let's look at the first one. John chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. 
John chapter 3, verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher. Come from God. For no man can do these signs that you do unless God was with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Man, that seems so disconnected to me. This Pharisee, he came to Jesus by night, and that's not by accident, because if he was caught coming to Jesus by day, he'd have probably been kicked out of the synagogue. He'd have been mocked. He'd have been persecuted. He would have been attacked. He would have lost friends, Pharisee friends. So he's sneaking around at night. Man, God doesn't want us as Christians to be sneaking around at night He wants us boldly standing in the day, declaring our love and loyalty to Jesus. Amen? And so Jesus, instead of being buttered up, it's like Nicodemus is buttering him up. We know you got to be from God. Nobody could do these signs and wonders if God wasn't with him. And notice Jesus didn't just bow up in pride and say, yeah, that's true. That's me. Praise God. (laughs) No, he cuts right to the chase and deals with the root of Christianity, the reason he came. He said, most assuredly, I say unto you, Nicodemus, a religious man, a man that has sold out to behavior modification and outward constraints and restrictions and rules and regulations and rituals, Most assuredly, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot even see the kingdom of God, much less enter on into that kingdom, much less enjoy the benefits of that kingdom or the power of that kingdom. Everything starts with being born again. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Man, that's just plain dumb. (laughs) Have you ever thought about that? Born again. How can a man, full-grown man, enter his mother's womb and be born over again? See, he's thinking natural, and Jesus is speaking supernatural. He's speaking after the flesh and the natural, and Jesus is speaking after the spiritual. After the spiritual. Jesus answered and said unto Nicodemus, that's the dumbest thing I have ever heard How can you be a Pharisee? Amen. That's what I'd have said, amen. (laughs) Jesus is a little better than me. Actually, Jesus is a lot better than me. Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say unto you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Spirit. Do not marvel that I say unto you, you must be born again. Do not be surprised. Do not marvel at the reality of the new birth, the reality of being born over, born again, born anew, born after now the Spirit of God. We've all been born in the natural. We've all come by by water and flesh. How many of you know you lived for nine months in water and mama's water busted and you as a human being came in into this world, but that's a natural birth. And everyone that gets saved and can be saved has to have a natural birth. That's why the angels, the demons that got kicked out of heaven cannot be born again. There's all these false teachings that are that are just everywhere that amazes me. And there's people that talk about the end and how everybody is going to be saved. And Satan and the demons are going to be saved. Unless you're born of water and the flesh, you cannot be born again. And so the new birth is for human beings. It's for you and I. And Jesus explained, born of water and born of, of, of the Spirit how that we're all born of the flesh, but he that's born again is born again of the Spirit. So we have to establish that when you get saved, when you make Jesus the Lord of your life, when you 
become born again, it's not natural. It's not of your flesh. Your body doesn't get born over. Your soul, mind, will, emotions, intellect, feelings, they don't get born anew, but it's your spirit that gets born again. And that's a mystery still to many people because a lot of people live their whole life and never understand we're a spirit being, we have a soul, and we live in these bodies. How many of you know your bodies are decaying? Look at your high school pictures, amen? Some of you are fading fast. I mean, it's like before my eyes. We're decaying. Our bodies are, are redeemed, or excuse me, purchased, but not redeemed in the sense of born over or made anew. And so our bodies are decaying. And that's where sin works. That's where Satan tempts you is in your body and in your unrenewed mind. When you get born again, you don't get a new mind. You don't get new feelings. You don't get brand new thinking and and a new, again, intellect. How many of you know if two plus two equals five before you get saved, after you get saved, two plus two is still going to equal five until you start listening to me? (laughs) Amen. Amen. But something happens that's real. In 1 Thessalonians chapter, chapter 5, verse 23, I pray the God, the very God of peace, sanctify you wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y, which means completely. I pray your whole spirit, your whole soul, and your whole body be preserved blameless unto the day or the coming of the Lord. Faithful is he who promised, who will also do it. Also do what? Present me to the Heavenly Father wholly, completely, spirit, soul, and body. And so we are a triune being created in the image of a triune God. We serve one God. Hear ye, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, I'm one person, but I'm three distinct separate parts. I have a body, I have a soul, and I have a spirit. And when I make Jesus the Lord of my life, it's my spirit that gets born again. It's my spirit that gets instantly saved, changed, joined to the very spirit of Christ himself. Everything I'll ever need in this life and the life to come is on the inside of my spirit. It's Christ in me now, the hope of glory. And the key to the Christian life now is doing something with my soul, my unrenewed mind, feelings, emotions, and my my body that's now decaying. And it's sad how many people do not understand this. And I tell you, my life was so transformed and changed. Once I saw I wasn't trying to get all these things from God but that I already have everything God has to give me on the inside of me in Christ, it it took the struggle out. It took the warfare with God out. It took the trying, and it led to now trusting and yielding to this new life on the inside of me, this new spirit on the inside of me. And it all begins with an awareness that you have a new spirit, that you are a new creation, that you are united to Christ, that your spirit is born again, your spirit is righteous and truly holy, your spirit has Christ in it, the hope of glory, it has joy in it. Do you know when you feel depressed, your spirit is not depressed? When you feel like everything's falling apart around you and and peace seems to be slipping, did you know your spirit abides in the Prince of Peace? And if you can learn in all circumstances and situations to yield to the born-again spirit, to the spirit of Christ that's on the inside of you, then things start changing supernaturally all around you. All around you. In Acts chapter 2, Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost how that Jesus was the Messiah. He was both, both Lord and Messiah. And let me tell you something. He didn't preach a politically correct message. He looked at 3,000 people that were gathered and said, you people killed Jesus. 
Man, most people would tell you if you preached like that, if you said that, you'd run everybody off. Amen. How many of you know there's something about the truth and the truth spoken in love that when evil is confronted, when sin is confronted, the Holy Spirit is responsible to convict people of their sin and to repent of their sin. We've got to quit apologizing from our pulpits across this nation for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ because it begins, and Peter modeled it, you people killed the Messiah. You rejected God's Messiah. And they were convicted in their heart, 3,000 of them, and said, what do we got to do to be saved? He said, repent, all of you, and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of all your sins. And then he talks about you can receive now the gift of the Holy Spirit. Everything starts with repentance. We have to repent of our sin. How can people repent of their sin if they don't know they have sin? The beginning of getting saved is knowing you're lost. The beginning of being made righteous by God supernaturally, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and with the very righteousness of Jesus, is seeing that you are not righteous without God. They saw their need for God, and they repented. And then it says they were baptized for the remission of their sins. Water baptism did not wash away their sins. That word for, be baptized for the remission of your sins. That word for means because of the remission of your sins. Water baptism doesn't save us, but it is an act of faith obedience that testifies outwardly of something that happens inwardly. And while my relationship with the Lord is personal, it's not private. If you haven't been water baptized and you've made Jesus the Lord of your life and you've been born again, your old man was crucified with Christ. It was buried with Christ. And you've been raised anew now with Christ, seated with Him in heavenly places on the inside. And God says, if you've made a confession of faith, if you truly have repented of your sin, follow the Lord now in water baptism. Water baptism is our first act of an inward fact of having a change on the inside, and now I model it on the outside. I'm buried with Jesus in baptism of his death, and I'm raised now a new man, new woman, into new life, and I'm going to walk and rule and reign in this life by this one man, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So all of us need to be water baptized. Again, not to be saved, but because we are saved, and the water baptism is the first public act and public profession now of your faith. And how many of you know, if you have Jesus on the inside of you, and you learn to do something with your body and your mind, you're going to be transformed daily yeah, as you walk with Jesus. And you're going to just be a witness. How can we be a witness if we embrace the same things the world embraces? How can we be a witness if we celebrate the same things the world celebrates? no. God has called us out of to the world into his marvelous light, the kingdom of his dear son now, and he wants us to be transformed by doing something with our bodies and now doing something with our minds. So salvation begins re with repenting of our sins. And according to Paul in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. For with our mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And with our heart, we believe unto righteousness now with God. So it begins with repenting, changing our minds, changing our direction, acknowledging Jesus as Lord. And then now we follow him in faith obedience the rest of our life, beginning with water baptism. Now let's go to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And I know this is familiar to many of you, but I don't know about you. I can't hear the Word of God too much. I've heard this, and I'm the one preaching it. <laughs> and I still need to keep hearing it, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. One of the problems in church culture that we face is familiarity. 
That can happen in a relationship in marriage. You just become too familiar and you take one another for granted an advantage of, of one another. In church culture, we hear certain things and we just unplug because we've heard that. Instead of staying plugged and seeing if there's something God wants to adjust in you, wants to change in you. Do not let familiarity to phrases keep you from leaning in as you're listening to the Holy Spirit in your life. You know, I've been to Mexico. I've been to Mexico five times. But that doesn't make me a missionary. But bless God, I know Spanish. I recognize Spanish. I could have an altar call in Mexico, and I have, and there's people, they're all speaking Spanish, and I recognize it. I'm familiar with it. That's Spanish. <laughs> but how many of you know, I have no idea what they're saying. <laughs> we sit in church and hear a phrase, born again. And we go, I'm familiar with that. And we miss what it means. We miss the depth and the width and the length and the height of what it really means to be born again. And so it is with these scriptures in Romans. Let's look at this with fresh eyes. Let's look at this and learn to have an ear to hear. Learn how to listen to the Holy Spirit. Learn how to yield, especially at church. A lot of transformation does happen at church but the main thing that happens at church, listen, is information, inspiration. On Sunday, we get inspired. At least I pray when I speak, I inspire you somewhat. I'm going to bring information, but transformation happens on Monday. Amen. If you forget on Monday, the information and inspiration you had on Sunday you're probably not going to have much change in your life. And that explains why you see people go to church for 40 years, and it's like they're just stuck on stupid. <laughs> I didn't call anybody's name. <laughs> I don't want to be stuck on stupid. I always want to be attentive to the Spirit of God, attentive to the Word of God. Many times we lose our respect for God's Word. We just get too familiar with it. I remember years ago, I was invited to a predominantly black church. And it was so exciting. And I began to minister. And I always open with a scripture. And then I quote scriptures just on the fly. And so I said, well, let's turn in our Bibles and I began to read the Scripture, and I heard all this noise, and everybody stood up. I thought, well, that's interesting. And so I finished the Scripture, and everybody sat down. Then I quoted a Scripture, and they stood up, and then they sat down, and then I quoted another. Man, it looked like a Catholic service that wasn't ever going to end. Never mind, that probably did not connect. Up, down, up, down. Uh, I had to stop and say, look, I know this is your custom. I'm cool with that. But I may quote 50 scriptures. <laughs> and so it would be okay not to have to stand when I quote one. But I respected that so much. I've never been a in a church since that did that. They just had such a respect for the Word of God. When, you, when someone reads the Word of God publicly, they had been taught you stand in respect and reverence to the Word of God. That was pretty powerful. I'm not saying and suggesting we have to stand every time we read a scripture, and definitely you're not going to stand when I'm preaching, <laughs> quoting scriptures. But we need to maintain reverence for the Word of God. In Romans chapter 12, look at verse 1. I beseech you, Therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to, unto God, which is your reasonable, one translation says, logical service. I love the way this starts off. I beseech, I plead with you, I beg you 
to now do something with your bodies. And I'm doing it, I'm pleading with you by the mercies of God. Man, I love that. Most people would read, read that, I beseech you by the wrath of God. I beseech you by the guilt and condemnation and punishment of God to do something now with your bodies. How many of you know God's not punishing us? God's not pouring wrath on us. God's not angry with us. No, I beseech you by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living sacrifice. Everybody say living sacrifice. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable or your logical service now. A living sacrifice. Sacrifice denotes death. Offering. And notice it's a living sacrifice. So it's a death that doesn't die. Amen. Whatever this living sacrifice is, it's a death of something that never dies. It has to be offered daily. A living sacrifice. See, I could help some of you go through this transformation 10 times faster if I could just walk with you 24 7 because I'd be throwing you up on that altar 25 or 30 times a day we've got to reckon that dead those thoughts that murmuring that complaining that unthankfulness that gossip whoa we got to get rid of that climb up on that altar fire take that out of him in Jesus name burn it amen the reason this thing takes the rest of our life is we won't stay on the altar. We keep climbing off the altar. And your bodies, dear ones, have been purchased. They've been bought. We have the promise and the hope of my body's salvation. But sin can still work in your bodies. Sin can't work in your spirit. It can't get into your spirit. Your spirit is sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. But your body, you can either yield it to the temptation of the devil and sin work in it still as a Christian, or you can yield it to the Holy Spirit and holiness work now in your body. Your body is amoral. Your body's neutral. It depends who you yield it to. And the devil will tempt you through your flesh and try to draw you away from God, and the Holy Spirit will convict you and draw you to yielding, becoming a living sacrifice, and God, by His Holy Spirit, burn as you offer fornication to Him, as you offer greed to Him, complaining to Him, murmuring to Him. Greed again, which is idolatry. Am I the only one that has struggled with things since I got saved? Boy, the rest of you, I guess we're struggling with you. <laughs> Temptation, being drawn the wrong way and having to make a decision. Am I going to become a living sacrifice? See, there's a lot of living sacrifice that happens right here, right now. This is where church can be very beneficial. If you're humble, you're hungry, you come prepared, you don't get offended. Boy, I, could spend, I, I wish I had more time now. I could spend some time on this. I guarantee you just sitting under the Word of God anointed, there's a purging that happens. There's a conviction that happens. There's this pruning that happens. You're just sitting there, and all of a sudden you're focused on the Lord and the things of the Lord, and man, you become a living sacrifice. You've yielded your body getting here, and how many of you know if you had kids, it was a living sacrifice <laughs> to get here even on time. And right now, I'm pulling every one of you up on the altar. And I'm doing 
selective surgery. With the Word of God, a two-edged sword, I'm cutting your members on the earth. I guarantee you, but I don't, I don't want to praise the Lord. If, I guarantee you, if you fornicated last night, you're not feeling real good right now. You're loved. You're still saved if you're born again. You did the right thing getting up and coming. But I guarantee you the Holy Spirit's wanting to cut that. He's wanting you to mortify your members, put to death your members on the earth. He wants you to repent of that, not feel guilt the rest of your life, not keep doing it. He wants you to offer that a living sacrifice. Lord, help me with this. Lord, I'm struggling in my flesh. And the Holy Spirit, if you'll stay on the altar, will deliver you. From fornication, from murmuring, from complaining, from gossip. Some of you need to climb up on the altar. See, a lot of times, some of you will come to church and your life is such a mess, I throw you up on the operating table, I open you up, and you get all offended and mad, and you jump off the table running out bleeding to death. We almost have to handcuff you to the altar, to the table. That sometimes, let me cut you open, but if you'll just be cool, I'll sew you back up and you'll be healed. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> but oh no, people get all mad. Boy, that knife hits your stinking thinking and that knife hits your bad attitude and that knife hits your traditions and your religion and your old flesh just bows up. And you don't want to do that in front of me because when you bow up in your flesh, I bow up and the lion of the tribe of Judah will come out of me and burn that out of your life if you'll submit. If you'll submit. And so we can do something with these bodies, listen, and they can be holy. If we learn how to be this living sacrifice, yield to God, repent, be quick to admit and submit a weakness because we all have them. Amen. I keep thinking I'm not going to have to crawl up on this altar one of these days. You know what I'm saying? Anybody been saved a while? And it's like, man, here I go again, climbing back up on that altar and becoming a living sacrifice. I want these hands to be laid on the sick and they recover, not hands that could hurt or damage somebody. I want this tongue to be a living sacrifice. And I want blessings coming out of it, not cursings. I want thanksgiving coming. Sometimes you have to put your tongue on the altar. Anybody snapped at their spouse lately? Don't raise your hand on that one. How many of you know your tongue is a part of your body? And just because you're born again and even spirit-filled doesn't mean you can't say something curt or short or rude or mean. And you have to be quick to repent. And the minute you repent, you're climbing up on the altar. And now the Holy Spirit helps sanctify, set apart your tongue. You become more conscious of it supernaturally. You're not just trying not to say something bad to your spouse. You're trusting God to say good things to your spouse. Amen. So we become a living sacrifice. Number two, or actually, number one was born again. Number two is a living sacrifice. So number three would be verse two. I don't know how I wound up in, in Psalms again. Give me a minute here. Romans 12, verse two. And do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove the word prove means demonstrate. What is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God? See, we'll never prove or demonstrate the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God unless we do something now with our bodies and something with our minds. It all starts with getting born again. We all start at the same place. Same, same miracle of God, the recreation of the human spirit. Now we're at different places depending on how much are we willing to yield our bodies to God in service, in sanctification, and renew our minds. Because if we do that, we demonstrate the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. That word conformed 
literally means to be shaped like, molded into. See, the world and the spirit of the world and the God of this world, listen, saints, is trying to take Christians and pour them, excuse me, pour them into a certain mold. They want Christians to compromise and look like them and sound like them and act like them. And we were once them. So I'm not condemning them. I'm saying I'm not of them. I'm of the kingdom of God now. And God doesn't want me molded or poured into some mold of the world, conformed into this mold, God says that He foreknew you and I, and whom He did foreknow, He did predestinate to be conformed into the image of God's dear Son. The Holy Spirit's trying to pour us into the mold of Jesus, while the world is trying to pour us into the mold of compromise. Of compromise. And you and I have to choose daily. We have to be a living sacrifice daily. How many of you know you have to put your thoughts on the altar daily? They go awry. They're pulled astray. And you have to harness your thoughts and put them on the, on the altar that, you know, I don't want, Lord, to think like the world anymore. I don't want to think like I used to think. I want to think in line with God's kingdom now, kingdom principles. I want a biblical world view versus a secular world view. And this is a process. Again, I've known the Lord since 1965. And yes, young people, there was a 1965. <laughs> and yet I stand here today and the world and access to the world and worldly thoughts are inundating us 24-7. We're living in an information revolution. There's more information available to us at our fingertips. I mean, you know who, you, I, I discovered who the smartest person in the world is. Siri. <laughs> she knows everything. You can ask her anything. A friend of mine, mine, and I haven't tried it, I need to try it, but he said something friendly to Siri and thanked her and appreciate her and what a good job she's doing. And she came back and literally said, let's keep it professional. <laughs> the world at breakneck speed is trying to get information in a little disc and be able to put it in your brain where you have access to Siri, access to Google, access to the database of the entire world. I can't imagine technology coming to the point something can be put in your brain that connects you to the World Wide Web like they're talking about doing and able to do. What a nightmare that will be if Jesus doesn't return before we get that depraved, before we get that kind of information flooding our brains of worldliness and demonic activity. You have to discipline your thoughts, dear ones, and it's not easy. It's simple. That scripture's simple. But it's not easy. Is this worldly thinking? Does life really begin at conception? And is that just a fetus? Or is that a human being on the inside of a mother's womb? Is the world going to end and are we going to destroy it with our natural resources? And global warming will be the end of the human race. Or, or is the world created by God sustained by God, upheld by God, and reserved for the day of judgment. You have to fight that every single day. Is evolution true? 
Evolution was the beginning of the collapse of our society as a Judeo-Christian society. Evolution offends people to this day. I was just in a meeting in Dallas, Texas, a conference, and one of the speakers mentioned evolution, and people got up and walked out because I don't want to hear any more. I believe in evolution and that the earth is billions of years old. And yet one simple scripture, there's many, but one simple scripture knocks in the head the theory, and it's still a theory. It's not science. It's not proven. It's a theory. And one scripture says, Romans chapter 3 or chapter 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. Somebody said, what's that got to do with evolution? Well, evolution says there was some type of life, microcosm of a type of life, and it evolved and died. And that one evolved and died. And this would, it's sin that brings death. There couldn't have been life and death before God and sin entered the world. And the very fact that Adam through sin brought death into the world knocks in the head any theory of life, death, evolution. And yet many in the church have embraced that, rejecting Genesis and creation and the reality of sin and death and how God created everything in maturity. The Bible doesn't teach we started with some lower form of life and evolved from goo. And we evolved to the zoo. And then from the zoo became you. <laughs> you got to have faith to believe that. God created us in His image and in His likeness. God created a full-grown man and a full-grown woman, mature. All the earth was created in maturity in six days. It didn't take billions of years to create the Grand Canyon. God just took His finger and went, I like that. <laughs> on and on we could go with just simple truths. And yet we are so inundated with worldly philosophies, worldly thinking, that we've hindered the transformation of a generation by teaching the simplicity of Jesus Christ, the simplicity of creation, the simplicity of how much God loves us. And listen, God loves the planet. God's not going to let you destroy it. He's reserved it. He's going he's to redeem it. He's creating a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness will rule and reign. And on and on I could go. I picked a few things off the top of my head. I shouldn't have. It got quiet even in this full gospel Presbyterian Episcopalian Church of Christ that let the drums in. Hallelujah. <laughs> we need to renew our minds to God, His love, His loyalty, His goodness, His faithfulness to you, His Word that is eternal. And it is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That word transformed in the Greek language is metamorpho. Metamorpho. Listen, it means the radical change of a being. The radical change of a being. We get, we get our English word metamorphosis, from the Greek word metamorpha, and metamorphosis is the radical change in the structure of an animal by a supernatural means. Can I get a witness? A caterpillar turning into a butterfly is supernatural. And can I get a witness? It's radical. Can I get a witness? A tadpole turning into a bullfrog is supernatural. It's radical. A caterpillar, and here's the thing God showed me after 1980, and I had that vision of the cross, and man, 
got my heart set on God, becoming a living sacrifice, renewing my mind. It was amazing how much my life changed and how fast it just changed. And this is one of the things God showed me is the caterpillar is restricted, listen, to the low life, but it has a high life on the inside of it. Where does the caterpillar get its wings to fly? Birds don't fly over and bring its wings. Nothing from the outside comes to the caterpillar to become the butterfly. It's all on the inside. But how many of you know the caterpillar will be restricted to the low life until it goes through a metamorphosis? And a metamorphosis is a struggle. The, 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 the climbing up the tree, the finding a limb, the spinning of the cocoon, the struggle inside of the cocoon as that which is within starts to come out. The breaking out of the cocoon. But if it cooperates, that which is inside of it that once was restricted to the low life after the metamorphosis is experiencing the high life. Experiencing freedom. Liberty, newfound liberty, newfound freedom, newfound, newfound perspective. How many of you know a caterpillar has one perspective of the world and a butterfly has a totally different perspective of the world? What's wrong with most, most churches? Some of you. Too many caterpillars, fuzzy worms are in here. Don't misunderstand me. God loves you, you fuzzy worm. But you don't have to be restricted to that low life. You don't have to be bound to that perspective. You can repent, not to get saved. The first time you repented, you got saved. Now your repentance is the changing of your mind to what God says is true. And suddenly, there may be a struggle. There may be this conflict. Just like right now, there's a spiritual war going on in your head right now with many of you. If you hang in there, a spiritual cocoon is being spun. And any day now, you're going to break out into a new deliverance, a new perspective. A changed life supernaturally. The... Tadpole is amazing to me. The tadpole is restricted to the aquatic world and it has a perspective that's different than the bullfrog. And this is pretty cool. The tadpole can only live in the underwater world, the aquatic world. If you pull the tadpole out before a metamorphosis, if you pull it out of the water, it dies. But if it stays in that water and goes through a metamorphosis, then that which was restricted to the aquatic world now, listen carefully, can not only experience the atmospheric world, but can live in both worlds. I've known this for decades, and that excites me. That while I'm in this world... And I experience things horizontally still in the world. I can walk after the Spirit and see things after God's world, after God's kingdom. Because God, Colossians 1.13, has delivered me from the powers of darkness, the aquatic world, and translated me into the kingdom of His dear Son, the spiritual world. And while I can walk in the flesh, I do not war after the flesh any longer. I have a new perspective, a spiritual perspective, a kingdom perspective, a heavenly perspective. I can croak. No, that's dying. Croak. What's a frog do? Croak. I got that right. I was testing you. I can, I can, <laughs> I can croak. I can hop. You can cut my legs off, put them in a frying pan, and they'll still hop. But none of that would have been possible, but was available when I was a tadpole. In, in our Sherman campus, 
Last, last week, I understand 12 people gave their life to the, to the Lord. Man, let's give the Lord praise for that. <laughs> Hallelujah. Those 12 people became caterpillars and tadpoles in the kingdom of God. And now if they'll present their bodies a living sacrifice and be renewed in the spirit of their mind, they'll go from a caterpillar to a butterfly, from a tadpole to a bullfrog. And I'm telling you, life is good as a butterfly. Life is good as a bullfrog. God loved me as a caterpillar but for 15 years. 1965 all the way to 1980, all I understood was the low life. And I was trying, and I was struggling. And all I had to do was yield my body to God daily. Lord, I'm, I'm your servant. When I mess up, I fess up. When I mess up, I repent, climb on that altar, trust God to burn that out of me, a living sacrifice. And then just keep renewing my mind to the things of God. Man, did anybody get anything? <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm going to pray and release all the locations to the campus pastor for whatever the Spirit's doing at your campus. Father, I just thank you for this service. What a great day. What a great day that we do get to live in this life and experience this life. And while there are setbacks, disappointments, hurts and pains in this life, there's also great victories in this life. But Lord, in the new life in Christ, there is nothing but victory. Thanks be unto you that causes us to always triumph in Christ Jesus the Lord and makes known the sweet fragrance of His, of His salvation in our lives. We just want to be a blessing, Lord. Thank you for blessing us first and now making us a blessing.